This presentation is based on a paper presented at the ESL SYN conference in San Francisco in June 2012. The paper is titled Transaction Accurate Interface Scheduling in High-Level Synthesis and was co-authored by Sean Dart, John Sanguinetti and Mike Meredith, all of Forte Design Systems. Before I begin, just a couple of comments on context and background. This paper is fundamentally about high-level synthesis and how it handles clock edges. In the paper, these issues are mostly dealt with in the context of synthesis from System C, since that is the area where we at Forte have the most experience. So, the title of this paper is big and complicated. Let me try to simplify it for you. This discussion is fundamentally about clock edges and how they are arranged by high-level synthesis tools. I'd like to start out with a two-minute primer on high-level synthesis and then explain how a high-level synthesis tool views an interface and why they may be treated differently when compared to traditional RTL models. I'll then compare the pros and cons of various mechanisms for dealing with interfaces in the high-level synthesis world. Basically, high-level synthesis tools take abstract descriptions that may have either no notion of time or a limited notion of time, and converts that abstract description into an RTL representation that is fully timed. The major task involved in this process is called scheduling, and involves the insertion of clock edges into the design and deciding in which clock cycle each operation should be performed. Operations include reads and writes to I.O. ports as well as things like multiplications and additions. Compare this to RTL design where the user manually inserts all the clock edges in the design. This applies to both control and data path operations, connections to memories, buses and other blocks or modules in the design. Again, Every clock edge that ends up in your gate-level model is there as a result of your manual actions. One of the major benefits of having the high-level synthesis tool decide the schedule is that you can quickly retarget your abstract model to different environments and performance nodes. In RTL, if you model something to take 10 clock cycles with a 65 nanometer technology, it will still take 10 clock cycles when you get to a 28 nanometer library. With an automated scheduler, this is not the case. Thus, the more abstract model, combined with high-level synthesis, is far more reusable. Interfaces are pieces of code that deal with I.O. These are often called protocols. For a block to communicate with another block, the two need to agree on a protocol of signals and implement those correctly. This involves a specific set of control and data signals arranged in time around specific clock edges. In traditional RTL models, this notion is not tricky at all, since the entire design implementation is completely scheduled around clock edges. You simply arrange the I.O. according to the protocol rules and write your code like any other RTL code. In high-level synthesis models, however, you have to ask the question, how do I model at a higher level but still produce an RTL block that will talk to my other RTL blocks according to a specific protocol? The two fundamental ways are you write completely abstract functions and have the high-level synthesis tool insert the protocols around it, or you somehow model the protocol as part of the high-level synthesis description and have it translated as part of the high-level synthesis process. The first of these is most common in ANSI C-based flows since that language has no notion of time. The latter is more common in system C flows since you have the notion of wait in this language which corresponds to a clock edge and thus allows the modeling of specific protocols. In the high-level synthesis world, there are many ways that interfaces have been dealt with over the years. Sometimes thinking has been guided by the choice of language and sometimes by the nature of the scheduling algorithms inside those high-level synthesis tools. One of the complexities in this story relates to the sometimes conflicting tasks given to the high-level synthesis scheduler. On one hand, it must implement specific protocols or interfaces exactly as specified. And on the other hand, it has the ability to add clock cycles where it wants in order to efficiently schedule the design. Clearly, the latter should not violate the rules of the former. So let's dive in and take a look at some specific techniques that have been used over the years. Here is an example of a simple function that is completely untimed. There are no clocks specified and we have no idea how the input parameters actually arrive into this block. Do we use a ready valid, do we use a FIFO, or something else? All the I.O. specification is handled outside the model itself. For example, there may be a GUI or some meta file that defines what kind of handshakes the high-level synthesis tool should use for each I.O. path. The high-level synthesis tool will schedule this code according to the user's constraints and insert clock edges wherever it chooses. 
This mechanism is fine for simple block-based design, but the verification at the behavioral level does not actually ever simulate the interfaces. The first time you actually simulate any functionality that includes the handshake is in the Verilog RTL, and this is quite limiting. For large, complex, multi-block implementations, this restriction becomes very important since we really need the high-level verification to include the verification of the interfaces as well as the content of each module. In a completely timed model, the user inserts a weight for every clock edge in the design. This is somewhat more abstract than RTL, but the designer is still handling the details of scheduling instead of leaving some freedom for the high-level synthesis scheduler to move things around and insert edges in the most optimal places. In this style of design, every weight implies exactly one clock edge, and no clock edges will exist in the output that was not explicitly modeled with a weight in the input. High-level verification is good with this approach, but the low-level nature of the input code really detracts from some of the key values of high-level synthesis, namely, high productivity due to that abstraction and the very flexible reuse story if you wish to retarget this design to another technology that requires a different schedule. For example, if you wish to have this model run at two times the performance, you would need to rewrite this code. Since we have an example here with a weight included, this is a good place for me to mention code motion rules. A high-level synthesis scheduler will have some notion of code motion these rules define the way in which the scheduler can move operations around clock edges. Every high-level synthesis tool has these rules, but they don't all have the same rules. And the different ways that these ideas are implemented has a big impact on both what you put into the high-level synthesis tool and what you get out. The superstate weight mode exists to give the high-level synthesis tool more scheduling flexibility than the completely timed case and relieve some of the coding burden from the user. Here, the weight statement is interpreted to mean insert at least one clock edge here, but you may insert more if you deem fit. Operations may not be moved across a clock boundary due to restricted code motion rules. This code does allow me to verify my interfaces during high-level verification, and it is a little more abstract, but it runs the risk that the high-level synthesis tool will insert clocks at the weight statements that are meant to imply protocol. This would break the protocol and produce an unusable design. One alternative would be to create different kinds of weights, some of which are exactly one clock cycle, and others which are at least one clock cycle. We could also use some kind of pragma to define the way in which weight is meant to be considered in specific code blocks. In this example, the pragmas define that the weight statements imply exactly one clock cycle, and any code outside of these blocks is completely untimed and thus the scheduler is free to do what it wants. In this case, the arithmetic operations will be restricted to occur between the timed blocks. This is better than superstate weight since the scheduler is free to schedule the untimed code more freely. Protocol scheduling is a refinement of the partitioned code blocks with one important improvement. Where there is a weight specified in the code, exactly one clock edge will be inserted. However, the code motion rules have been relaxed so that this will only restrict motion of I.O. operations and not arithmetic operations. Consider the code example. A loop reads eight values into an array. This is in a protocol section and thus there are hard clock edges. Then a loop iterates over the array performing a summation. Then we output the sum value. This again requires strictly clocked handshakes. Since the arithmetic operations are now fully mobile, they can move up to overlap the protocol. In this way, we can perform the first add as soon as the first value has been read. The scheduler can arrange this so that the final value is available the clock cycle after the last element has been read from the input. In addition, we will not require eight values to be stored in the array. Really, this will only need to store a single value. This mode provides all the verification advantages previously noted, and raises the level of abstraction and provides superior results in terms of both area and speed than previous weight-based modes. One of the huge advantages of moving to a higher level of abstraction for modeling is that these languages provide very powerful mechanisms for encapsulating complexity. Interfaces introduce a lot of complexity and it is good to hide as much of that complexity as possible. It's very common to encapsulate the handshakes we saw in previous examples and access them through calls like get and put 
Not only does this make the general code look a lot simpler, it allows you to build and deliver entire interfaces as encapsulated C++ classes. They can be debugged and optimized once, and then reused throughout your organization. However, once we make this much simpler, we can quickly see some limitations to our previous concepts. Consider the following code. In this case, we get some data, perform two memory reads, perform some calculation, and put the result. This is actually four complete protocol operations. Each of the memory accesses requires I.O. and includes wait statements which translate to clock cycles. If we followed the preceding rules about code motion, these two memory reads would be performed serially, since we cannot move any I.O. operations across a clock edge. This is clearly non-optimal. Transaction accurate scheduling introduces the notion that some protocols can be identified to be encapsulated, such that the I.O. code motion rules are relaxed and the I.O. operations may move across clock edge boundaries implied by other transaction accurate blocks. Of course, they do have to honor clock edges implied inside their own protocol specification, as well as hard clock edges implied by regular protocol blocks. In our example, this would mean that the read of memory 2 could legally move before the read of memory 1. Most likely, the scheduler would arrange these two memory reads directly in parallel, giving us a more optimal design. It appears that this should be easily solved for memory accesses, but what we are discussing here is a general protocol implementation. In general, this technique should be applied to any kind of interfaces, not just to memory interfaces. Here is another example that shows how the transaction accurate protocols are bounded by regular protocol blocks. In this case, the memory accesses may be inverted or executed in parallel, but they cannot cross the boundary imposed above them by the go.read. This allows you to keep the code high level and flexible, but honor the synchronization imposed by some external block. This form of interface modeling is very high level, particularly when using pre-canned interface IP, and allows the maximum of flexibility for scheduling both micro operations like adders and multipliers, and macro operations like bus or memory IO. We've demonstrated here some of the different mechanisms that have been implemented by high level synthesis tools over the years. This is not an exhaustive list, but it does serve to raise some of the issues that need to be considered when implementing a flexible scheduler that can also deal with user-specified protocols and clock-based timing. Thanks for watching the presentation. I hope this has helped to improve your understanding of scheduling in high-level synthesis and the impact that different scheduling mechanisms will have on your models and RTL results. For further details, please look us up at www.forteds.com.